early one morning in the Scholars Centre, in the Reed Library, before anybody else had arrived, Michael called to me across the room. He wanted to show me a passage in the book that he was browsing. Apparently something had amused him, and so I strolled across to look. The author of the book had served in South Arabia at the time that Michael served. He told of meeting a man one day, dressed in khaki, with an ammunition bandolier slashing across his tunic. He said he cut an impressive, larger-than-life image. This man strode across the desert to introduce himself. And that, the author said, is how he met the extraordinary Michael Crouch. <laughs> so how do we commemorate such a life? How do we do it without descending into, into platitudes? First, the very word platitudes conjures up commonplace dullness, boredom, just to name a few cliches. And how unlike Michael was that? In introducing his autobiography, Michael said that, and he described himself almost apologetically, that a young chap who had a natural ebullience, something he thought was out of place if a young man wanted to go anywhere. Well, for those of us who know Michael, we can report, thankfully, that he never did curb that natural enthusiasm, but nor did it stop him getting on in the world. Now, were Michael standing beside me at the moment, I think he'd probably mildly scold me, in his self-deprecating way, he'd say, how dare you suggest that I got on in the world? Rather, all I did was doing what was required in the circumstances and occasionally doing what was what I found pleasurable. Yeah. But he did much more than that too, as we all know. Clearly, some of his adversaries in South Arabia thought so. Three attempts to assassinate him is testimony to that. But so also is the fact that when the events that triggered the death sentence declaration on Michael had passed, the man who in 1967 had organised those attempts on Michael's life could find in Michael a man with whom he was happy to forge a friendship and who could say of his failed attempts at assassination, God had made his aim bad. And perhaps that's what <coughs> when Michael says doing what is required in the circumstances. Field Marshal Lord Guthrie, who was then chief of the British Defence Staff, wrote in his foreword to Michael's autobiography that a political <coughs> officer was given great responsibility, a little guidance, and then just trusted to get on with it. Now, get on with it seems a quintessentially British term. What does it mean? I take it to mean to show initiative, fortitude, intelligence, decisiveness. If it goes wrong, don't complain, fix it. But what it is remains delightfully vague, intriguingly so. Perhaps it means any exigency, emergency, catastrophe. And you couldn't get a man more suited to that task than you know. Perhaps unnecessarily, after all that, Charles Guthrie adds, his life was never boring, sometimes frustrating, and often extremely dangerous. And even less helpfully, I suppose, one of his superiors said to Michael, getting this advice, Remember, Michael, a dead political officer is a damn nuisance. <laughs> now, Michael often told me that at that point he decided that he would become a professional caller. <laughs> no. That was a role to which he could never adapt. Michael seemed to have received an abundance of good advice, though, on his way through. 
He had well-meaning friends, like the one who sent him a letter when he was about to sail off on the SSS uh, Salwing, the vessel that was going to take him to South Arabia at the start of his extraordinary life there. And the letter from this old friend said, take plenty of exercise, eat the best food you can get, and broaden your mind whenever you can. Be kind and considerate and polite, and I expect you will get the best out of life. Well, as Michael's task was, amongst other things, to spend months in the desert ensuring that rival leaders would not try to kill each other, to keep the infrastructure intact and the British flag flying, exercise was no problem. And with such a remit, I suppose, broadening one's mind just goes with that territory. However, I wonder what the old family friend would have made of Michael's attempt to eat a whole goat's heart attached to a windpipe from which no amount of masticatory manoeuvres could separate him. <laughs> All without insulting his host, who had placed his delicacy in front of Michael because he was the guest of honor. And Michael wrote in his book on the episode, as for spitting it out, I might have disgraced the whole British Raj, for my view, and I did care. So Michael just got on with it. Charles Guthrie would have approved of it. And that also nicely captures the other part of the old family friends advice. Be kind, be considerate, and be polite. Does that not describe Michael? Except we need to add one thing. If one is to take the best out of life, and Michael would say this, one also has an obligation to contribute something to it. And he did contribute. First of all, as a political officer, and that was exciting, and it was dangerous. He met his share of that. And he had to deal with the consequences when some of those who also shared it did not survive the danger. But he also had to combine his obligations to the Crown with his obligations to the people who were there to advise and help him, and also, most importantly, to his family. In this, at the time, he was fortunate to have the support of his equally courageous wife, wife Lynette, who was a nurse and who gave practical help to those who needed it, whilst caring for her own babies, Charles and the